Welcome everybody to the debugging workshop um, with some colleagues from the United States. So really pleased to have this and um, I'm not going to talk too much. I'm just going to be quiet now and pass over to Shannon for a debugging workshop. Thank you so sure. much. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, um, I'm Shannon Pelleggi. I am a data scientist at the Prostate Cancer Clinical Trials Consortium. Um, I really enjoy this content a lot. Um, and also it's very iterative and it's like uh, interactive uh, when we do the workshop. It's a, probably like a little challenging to give online um, because it's kind of one of those things where it's like really helpful to have someone over your shoulder looking at your computer screen talking you through things, but we're going to do our best to get through there, this. Um, we also have uh, two friends and colleagues on the phone. Uh, Daniel Soberg uh, is at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and he's very familiar with this content um, and helped uh, with a workshop earlier this summer with this content for our studio conference. And also Ryan Johnson is on the line who also helped at the same workshop. So um, don't be afraid to like pop questions in the chat and they'll get to you as fast as they can. Um, we'll be taking breaks. We'll have time for exercises. If you ever need me to slow down or repeat myself, like, you know, this can be what you want it to be. And you, you don't have to, but I will say like teaching on Zoom is a thousand times easier if you have your cameras on. <laughs> so I can actually see your faces and not talk to black boxes because I have like, it's kind of helps me, you know, see if you're getting it, but no pressure if you can't put your camera on or don't want to for any reason. I understand that it makes it more fun for me too. All right. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, so today we're going to be talking about debugging. Uh, and we have a lot to get through. Um, actually, the last time we ran this workshop, we only had an hour and a half time slot and we didn't get through nearly all of it. Um, I wanted to be able to slow down and hopefully get through most of the material. So that's why I told um, Zoe that we could put this down for three hours and uh, see where we go. So let's talk about getting started with debugging. Um, this work is under a Creative Commons license, and this was actually originally developed as part of the two-day RStudio conference uh, workshop, what they forgot to teach you about R. So this was one and a half hour session in that two-day workshop. If you are working locally on your own computer, um, this is the checklist you would need. So you would need to have a pretty recent version of R, you'd need to have a pretty recent version of R Studio, and you would need your computer ready to build packages. But like, if you don't have that, that's fine because we have an R Studio cloud workspace set up for this workshop. And I definitely encourage you just to use that cloud workspace for this workshop um, because we have everything installed that you need there as well. Um, and I do believe Zoe was telling me that not all of you have our studio. Can I? Um, the question is, do you have our studio? And can you type in the chat yes or no? All right. Um, I don't know if I'm misremembering the conversation that we had, Zoe. Um, but okay, so it looks like everyone has our studio. Uh, for the most part. So that's great. So you'll be able to use a lot of these uh, tools um, that we talk about as well on your own machine, but probably just still stick with a cloud instance for the workshop. And thank you for being patient with me when I had to reschedule last week. I still have like a tiny bit of a cough. I'll try to go on mute when I when that happens. There's a ton of additional resources if you want to go back and learn more. And of course, this recording is going to be available so you can revisit as well. And what workshop is complete without a visual from Allison Horse? So at any time any of us um, get into debugging, there's a lot of emotions around it, like curiosity and zombie meltdowns. And we need to take a break and walk away from it. And eventually we get it and it feels like really good when we get it. Um, and this can apply to like, like small debugging scenarios where you're really just trying to troubleshoot what's going wrong. But we're also going to be talking about like 
proper debugging tools in this workshop. So first, like we have to start with our basis. Like when something goes wrong in R, like the first thing we do is like a certain amount of troubleshooting before we get into those debugging tools. And I want to make sure you all know, like kind of like those best troubleshooting steps that you can take. So one thing you can do is do a search, right? Like you can Google the exact error message. You can look on our studio community. You can look on Stack Overflow and the R tag. And if you're like not feeling like you're super proficient in your Google search, um, Samantha Sisk had a great workshop um, about teaching me how to Google, and I would recommend that you look at that. Another thing that's really, really important for debugging that might that not all people might know is to reset R. It's actually like you know the best thing for your computer or your phone or like R when anything goes wrong. You want to try turning it off and on again. And so you want to restart R, like especially when things get weird. Like this is always a first step you should take. And there's a couple of different ways you can do this. So in your R Studio menu, you can go to session and drop down to restart R. And there's also keyboard shortcuts. So I'm always using Control Shift 10, uh, F10 because I'm on Windows. There's a Mac keyboard shortcut as well. But another thing that's really helpful, which is also kind of a lifestyle thing, um, is this these options in your uh, global workspace. So if you go to tools, global options, and we'll have an opportunity to do this together like in two seconds, tools, global options, and workspace, there's these options for your workspace. And you want to have restore.r data into workspace at startup unchecked and save workspace to dot R data on exit set to never. And so that means that anytime you do restart R, you're starting with a fresh, clean environment, which is also really important for debugging. That is also like a lifestyle to adopt into um, that I highly recommend uh, when you're ready. So I think I was playing around with the RStudio Cloud workspace last night. And I actually don't think these options were selected in your RStudio Cloud workspace. So that is our first exercise. And this is a great place for you to like see it in action to see if it's something you want to adopt on your own computer without messing up your own computer settings. So we're going to go to the RStudio Cloud workspace. I'm going to drop this link in the chat over here um, if you don't have access to the slides. So when you click on this, uh, we should open it up. I am going to, and I see a lot of people already in here. I'm hoping, this is kind of my first time teaching on our Studio Cloud, uh, so hopefully it all goes well. Um, uh, it's going to take me a minute to open up my RStudio Cloud instance of this project. <clears throat> all right. Mine opened up with a lot of stuff because I was playing around with things last night. So I'm just going to clear all that stuff out. But hopefully you all have um, a clean slate. Um, can you confirm with me that when you get in, you have a, a clean slate? You're not really seeing all this junk pop up. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Matt. OK. And so what we're going to do together for this first exercise um, is we are going to um, uh, set our workspace options. So again, we're going to go to tools, global options, and workspace. So tools, global options. And I'm just going to pause here. So I'm not really sure where everyone is at, like if you've got your RStudio Cloud instance loaded or not. Um, so can you give me like a, a yes in the chat or a thumbs up in the chat if you, you've gotten into this RStudio Cloud instance? All right, I see some thumbs up on the screens. Awesome, thank you. All right, <clears throat> I'm seeing a lot of thumbs up. So we're gonna go to tools, global options, and we're gonna make sure these options are set uh, tools, 
global options. And then we're going to go to right here in the middle where it says workspace. So you want to make sure that restore.r data into workspace that's set up is whoop, mine. Um, reconnected. Okay, so I'm just going to go back to tools, global options, and I'm looking at the workspace. And so I want to make sure that restore.art data into workspace that's set up is unchecked and save workspace dot our data on exit is set to never. Know why my session keeps disconnecting. It may be that somebody else is trying to go into the same project as you. And if they're going in, then you come out. Um, I'm not sure about the settings. I'll just have a look to see if people are not necessarily setting up a new project and they're going directly in and clicking on the um, actual okay. project that you're in, you're getting booted out. Is there... Well, Anything I can do on my end to get um, better instructions? I can share some instructions that we use for the NHSR okay. introduction to R in our studio. Just there are a couple of ways of doing it with the cloud, so we can help set that up. Okay. And I'll, I'll have a look at the settings overall. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. All right. So again, we did tools, global options, and we want our workspace settings to look like this. Don't restore data never say workspace. Can I get another round of thumbs up and yeses if we're good with that? Awesome, thank you, James. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Cass. Thank you, Daniel. Um, if you need help with anything, you want to make sure you scroll down, click apply, click OK to save those settings. And if you need help with anything, certainly um, drop a question in the chat. All right. So again, we're talking about like basic troubleshooting steps, right? And and one is like, re first we talked about Google, second we talked about resetting, turning things off and on again, and now um, we're talking about a reprex. And if you haven't heard of a reprex, a reprex is a minimal reproducible example. It is a package in R that helps you create these reproducible examples. And we're not going to get into the details of the reprex, but the idea is for the minimal part, like to find a needle in a haystack, like try looking in a smaller haystack, like make the problem smaller. And for the reproducible part, it's like when you're describing a problem like online or to a friend, there is a spectrum of like what you think you're saying or doing and like what you're actually doing and it doesn't always match. So that's why you want that code to be reproducible um, so that people can help you with your problems. And also, like it's not just for other people to help you with their problems because it this graphic is very true for me as well. Like anytime I go to make a reprex, I often solve the problem myself and don't actually have to put it out into the universe. So it's a great exercise to discipline yourself to solve your own problem as well. Um, and I believe I had a link here that I wanted to highlight. Yeah, okay, so it's in the footnote over here. I should make this a little bit more bigger. Um, because if you've never made a reprex before or you're not really sure how to do it or what it is, I highly recommend this talk by Charlotte Gelfand in 2021 to make a reprex, please. Um, she's got beautiful slides, great talk. It's not that long, maybe 20 or 30 minutes, and it's very much worth it. All right, so those are our troubleshooting strategies with like search, reset, and reprex. But like things can still come at you, like even after you take those basic steps. 
And when those things come at you, it can really help to understand the formal debugging tools that you have at your disposal in R. So we're going to move from troubleshooting to those formal debugging techniques. And when we talk about these uh, formal debugging techniques, here are the key concepts we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the traceback, which has this um, symbol of like a road. That's the location, which indicates where in your code did that error actually occur. We're going to talk about the interactive debugger, which has this little bug, ladybug symbol. And that's going to help you find context of why did the error occur. And then we're also going to be differentiating between techniques that you can use on your own code that's on your local machine with the magnifying class versus code that like is someone else's that you don't have access to. Like maybe it's on GitHub or maybe it's in another R package. But like it's not your code on your machine and you need to dig into that. And that's the wizard hat. And so here's everything that we're going to talk about for the next three hours. Um, we are going to talk about certain functions. We're going to talk about certain options. And we're going to talk about things that you can do in the IDE. Um, and, and then we're going to differentiate them in terms of like, are they good for traceback? Are they used for the interactive debugger? Can you use them for your code? And can you use them for their code? <clears throat> but I know that's a lot, like it's super overwhelming. Like there's so many tools here. Um, and these tools will achieve similar objectives slightly differently. And you don't use all the tools at once. You just kind of like pick one that like you're comfortable with and feels right to you and you use it. And I'm going to just pause here. We haven't paused for questions yet. Questions are always welcome in the chat, and I'll pause to see if there's any questions before I move on. All right. So one thing that um, we just should talk about briefly is sourcing. So when we get into these formal debugging tools, what I was doing in the beginning when I was trying to use these debugging tools is I was kind of like highlighting chunks of code, like my functions, and I was like submitting them to the console. And I was like, things look, are like working like funky, like I don't know what's going on here. And then I realized it's because I wasn't sourcing my scripts. So when you want to dig into these formal debugging tools, it's very, very helpful if you have a separate script with your R functions and that script is named and you source that script in. And uh, there's two ways you can do that. You can do that using the source button in the R Studio IDE. You can also use it, do it using the source command. And that is really going to give you the best debugging experience. And we're going to get to demonstrating that very, very soon. So here is the basic setup that I'm going to use. And now I'm going to need to start doing some gymnastics uh, to switch back and forth between my slides and my R Studio because I want to do some live coding so you can see what's happening. So gymnastics time. Here we go. And then also my Zoom bar always is like at the top here. I don't think I can even move this Zoom bar. Okay. Um, so I am in my R Studio workspace. You can put whatever you want in it. So I'm just going to um, open up a new script and put this code in here. I'm going to name this uh, script to my functions and just drop it into this project. Um, and so here we have some functions. Um, so we have the function, um, I'm going to delete this and I'm going to go ahead and source this. Um, so we have sourced, I did that probably very quickly. Let me reset. Um, I'm going to reset R and I'm going to uh, make sure that we see what's happening here. So I have an R Studio script open. The R Studio script is named myfunctions.r. It doesn't matter where it lives. Um, and I have two functions in it, one that is just taking a value of x, a variable of x and adding one. 
And then G is just that same function, F of X. So I'm gonna go over here to source it in so we can use our debugging tools. And um, the e quickest way to do that is just to click the source button. And when you click that source button, now these functions live in our workspace over here. So if I wanna do G of one, um, no problem, right? Cause we're just doing one plus one is two and we don't get an error. And if I do G of a character A, we're getting an error because you can't add A and one. So that is the stage that we are setting right now. Wow, oh, yes, move my Zoom bar. This is perfect. Okay, okay. And this is kind of this instance where we're debugging our own code, right? Like, so like I have a script that contains my functions. It lives locally. This is my code that I am debugging. And so one of the first steps you might take or one of the first things you might've been taught or maybe the only thing you know is to kind of like iteratively change the composition of your function to print to yourself helpful messages or helpful errors. And I'm not actually gonna demonstrate this, but you can um, like insert print statements into your function to kind of show you what the objects actually are that can help you provide context about where the error occurred. So here we're just printing the value of X and you can see it's A. You can also, a, a similar way you can do that is with a cat function, which can sort of like mix, you know, the values of your variables and other text as well. Um, so you can say, oh, look, I'm trying to execute the function F. And then when I execute the function of X, the value of X that I'm putting in is A. Um, just kind of give yourself some more context about like what you're seeing through these steps. Um, so print debugging is like a real thing, but there's actually like more tools out there that you can use. So let's start with our first formal tool. The first formal tool is a traceback. And a traceback shows the sequence of calls that leads to an error. So if we're, I'm already in my RStudio environment. Okay, so there's a question from Matt. Is a function that you source different from a function defined by typing it in the console? Um, no. So the function will live in your environment over here and it will have the same definition. However, I'll show you in one minute that you don't get the same um, nice features for debugging. So here we've already executed this function in such a way that it triggers an error. This function was sourced into our environment. So now I'm gonna just type traceback to see where that happened. And so you can see there's a sequence of calls that it goes through to show you what happened. So first, what happened was that we executed G of A, and now we stopped at item two, step two, um, where we had some problem in the function f of x. And it also gives you a little bit more context here about where f of x was called. So you can see here, it says r number five, and that's telling you, well, f of x was called on row five of your script. Like it knows the line numbers. And the only way that it knows the line numbers is when you actually source this in. So I'm gonna um, restart R. And what's beautiful about what we just did earlier um, about like not saving our data and not saving your workspace and all that is that when you restart R, you are gonna have a fresh environment if you're not used to that. So my functions F and G are gonna disappear. So I've restarted R. But now let's do the alternative where we just submit it in our workspace without sourcing. So I'm not sourcing, I am just submitting this to the console. Now I'm gonna trigger my error by calling G of A. I get the same error. I have the same functions that live in my global environment. But when I do my trace back, it's gonna look a little bit different um, because like it's not like knowing the line numbers anymore because we didn't source it in. So sourcing in those functions helps, gives you that additional context.
All right. So trace back, I know it's like a very kind of a, a small example here. And when we get to our exercises, you're certainly going to have the opportunity to dive deeper into all of these things. So trace back again is going to tell you the location of where that error occurred and the sequence of calls that lead to that error. There's other options you can set for trace back. So you can set your global options using the rlang package to something called entrace. Um, and it's going to give you a slightly different view. So let's try this. So I'm going to copy this. I'm going to restart R. I'm going to clear this out so it's not junky. Uh, maybe I shouldn't clear it out. Anyway, I'll do I'll do source. I'll trigger the error. I'll do a regular traceback. Um, and you can see what the regular traceback looks like. Now I'm going to set my options to Arling and trace. Um, and I've already got the Arling package installed for you here. So we're setting an error option. And now I'm going to trigger my error again by calling G of A. And now we still see the same error message, but we have this helpful note. It says run Arling last error uh, to see where the error occurred. So if you're looking at this closely, oh, I forgot to ask if my font size is okay. Do you need me to um, zoom in? Or are we good on the font size? Good. Okay. All right. So the traceback now looks like a little bit different, right? You have a little bit more context in traceback. Um, so the, the base R traceback function just kind of shows you the sequence of calls, but our R lang tra traceback shows you where that function lives. It tells you it lives in the global environment. Um, and it does do the ordering reverse, right? So here we start at one and move our way up. Um, and then here we're going from one and moving our way down through the code. And it also tells you use our laying last trace to see the full context. Um, and this is kind of a nice little visual as well that kind of shows you uh, functions that get called from functions um, a little bit more visually. And so I think it, it takes some practice to kind of understand and get used to like the different views. Um, but you don't have to use set this option. It's there if you want it to get you a little bit more richer information from your traceback compared to the base R function. And again, the reason why you're getting these row counts here, like row five, column five, um, is because we sourced our function. So we talked about our lang last error, and we've talked about our lang uh, last trace. And if you have used an R profile, an R profile is a place where you can put R code that gets executed on the startup of R. And you can put this option in your R profile if you wanted to, um, just to have it be the default traceback mechanism for your code. I'm going to pause here for questions. Okay. So this is a picture um, from the advanced R book and the deep debugging chapter just kind of outlines um, a few differences between the base traceback function and the R lang functions. So you'll see like top to bottom um, on the traceback and then on the R lang functions, the ordering is reversed. Um, so just different ordering between the base R traceback and the R lang and depending on what you're doing, it can be different numbering as well. It's just something to be aware of if you're exploring both and you're getting a little confused. All right, so now we're getting into, we've talked about our traceback. 
that's the location of where the error occurs. But now we want to find context around why the error occurs. And that's where the browser function comes in. So what we can do is we can put this browser statement in the body of our function. It can go anywhere in the body of your function. And it's going to open up the interactive debugger. It's pretty cool if you've never used it before. So let's do that. So again, um, I'm going to restart R, get a clean workspace, and I'm going to put a browser statement in here. I'm going to put it at the top level. I'm going to save, and I'm going to source, and nothing's happened. I am going to uh, call G of one. Well, yeah, sure. Let's call G of one. All right, so G of one, we know is an execution that should um, not trigger an error, right? Even though it doesn't trigger an error, we put the browser statement into the body of our function, which means every time that function is executed, I want to open the interactive debugger at this place. So we've called G of one now. I'm going to go over here so you can see a little bit more of what's in my environment. Um, and it opened up this new world for us. We are now in the interactive debugger. And things look a little bit different than they did before, but not totally different. So some things that you are going to notice is that we have this green arrow on the left-hand side of our script. It kind of tells us where we are in terms of our code and where we, what we have and have not executed yet. So we're on this yellow uh, highlighted line. That means we've executed the browser statement and that is where our function is at. We also have um, this new context over here in our environment. Uh, it'll let you see different environments uh, for your objects. And right now we are in the environment for this function f of x. Now the browser behaves just like an R console. So I'm in here. I can do one plus two is three. Um, I can retrieve the value of x that I submitted to my function. I can look at the structure of x. Um, I can do ls.stir to list out all objects in my environment and their structure. So I can execute any code that I want to and play around with anything I want to to see how things are operating and how they react. I'm going to come back to this menu in the next section. But for now, um, there are certain key commands that you can use when you're in the browser or the interactive debugger. So one you can use is in, which goes to the next statement. So you're going to see that highlighted line move down as soon as I enter hit in. So now um, we are at the line x plus one. And if I want to execute that line, I'm going to hit in again, which in this case will exit the function, I believe, because um, that's the last line. Um, so that was the last line of code. It, um, it executed, it resolved to two, and now we're out of the browser. Uh, we can do the same, and that one's just on G of one, where like G of one doesn't result in an error. So if we put in G of A, and G of A we know results in an error, we can kind of do the same thing where we want to try debugging. I can press in here. I can see, oh, I'm going to about to add X plus one, but what is the value of X? Oh, the value of X is actually a character value. Like I can see why that's going to result in an error now. If you wanted to execute, um, terminate the interactive debugger, I think you can hit Q for quit um, or this stop button. So I'm going to press Q. It's not Q. <laughs> Forget what it is now. Let's see here. It is something that I can't see on my side. I thought it, oh, maybe it's a capital Q. Hold on. Yeah, capital Q for quit. Um, or you could press that stop button. You you are going to have time to practice on your own with the interactive debugger when we get to our first exercise. Um, 
And let me get back into my slides. All right, so when you're interacting with the de debugger, like just to reiterate, you can execute any R code that you want to. And these are some really common, helpful ones to execute, like ls to see everything that's in your environment, ls.stir to see everything that's in your environment and the structure of it, or just stir a specific objects, the structure. You can execute print statements. And then there's these um, different commands. The Q is not showing, sorry, it's a capital Q that you can use to control the execution of the interactive debugger. So this is what we've talked about so far. We've talked about some very first steps you can take to debug your own code. We can do print debugging. We can um, do two different types of traceback, the base R and the R lang one. And then we can just put a browser statement into our, the body of our function to trigger and open that interactive debugger. And it's gonna open it every time that function is called, regardless of whether or not it results in an error. So we're gonna go to our first exercise now. I'm going to walk you through it a little bit because it, when we did this live uh, this past summer, I think people were like, I'm gonna just walk you through it uh, to give you a little bit of a head start uh, so it doesn't take all day. And then I'm gonna give you time to play with it on your own. So I'm gonna close out my functions. I'm going to restart R. And just clear the screen. And we're going to go to our 01 exercise folder. Now, there are three different levels. It's choose your own adventure here. If you want to speak through it, you should probably choose the solution. Um, if you want to just like really challenge yourself, I would go with Spartan. Um, or if you want to kind of like be a little bit of a middle ground between challenging yourself and not seeing this full solution, I would go with Comfy. I'm going to open up the debugging solution here so you can see what's happening. All right. Um, the context of this exercise is actually from a keynote from Jenny Bryan. It was the R Studio conference keynote from 2020. She gave a talk titled object of type closure is not susceptible. And this is the exact problem she demonstrated in that keynote. So I want to show you what the zero one source me script is. That is a script I want you to source. So in this script that I want you to source, we have a data set of fruit, and then we have a function that computes a fruit average. So I'm going to go ahead and source this. Now we should see fruit and fruit average um, in our uh, in the global environment. And if we go back over here, uh, you can also view the fruit data. So just so you can see what is in it, uh, we have four columns, one for blackberry, blueberry, plum, and peach. Um, and then we have different attributes recorded about those columns, which are calories, weight, and yumminess. And we're trying to take the average uh, over these columns. So if we take the true fruit average for peach, maybe we want an overall score. Whoops, I did not mean to do that. Uh, maybe we wanna take the fruit average for berry. So we want the overall score Let's uh, clear the screen so you can see a little bit, a little bit better. All right, here are our fruits, and here is our fruit average uh, execution. So we have two different types of berry fruits. We've got blackberries and we've got blueberries, and we want to know, like, overall, how is are the fruit in our berry family doing in terms of their scores? Um, we can average those columns, so we've got average calories, average weight, and average yumminess. But what happens when we actually try to do this on something that has a single column in it? And that's going to be the peach column. So when we do this on the peach column, we get this error. And it's maybe a little hard to diagnose or figure out why you're getting that error. So I want you all now to take a turn, continue on with these scripts, practice, with the traceback and the interactive debugger by hitting the browser statement, 
And I want you to, to see if you can determine exactly why and where that bug is occurring. And if you happen to have time, try to fix it. No worries, if not, I'm gonna start the timer and let you all work on your own. You are welcome to drop comments in the chat as you're exploring this.
Did you all hear the gaming noise or is that just on my computer? When the timer went off, there was a cute little gaming noise that just went off. <laughs> okay. Um, so that is time. Do you feel like you had sufficient time to explore that exercise? Do you want any more time? Thumbs up if you feel like you had sufficient time and you're ready to talk about it. Or say in the chat more time if you want a little bit more time to explore. <laughs> All right, we have one comment that there was enough time, but there wasn't a fix. Um, yeah, the fix is like simpler than uh, don't don't do gymnastics for the fix because it is like an argument. Like, yeah. Okay, so uh, let's talk about some very important things to this exercise, and let me step through it as well. We had some great. Um, Shannon, uh, sorry, yeah. I can't hear you. Really? Oh, must be me. Uh, Sorry. I hear okay. Oh, Zoe. Thanks. Oh no, Zoe. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'm sad Zoe can't hear, but I'm glad everyone else can. Hopefully Zoe can get uh resolved soon. Um and oh no. Okay. And we had some great chat, uh some chatter over here. Um so first, uh, Zoe said, I've just realized that the interactive debugger is doing what I often do manually to understand my functions. Yes, that is all the interactive debugger is doing. So oftentimes um, when we have an error in our function and we are trying to figure it out, we are like manually setting objects in our environment, manually walking through our code line by line. And just trying to figure out where things happened and the debugger is a safe environment where you can achieve that um, but it's like not polluted by other uh, objects in your workspace no interaction effects there um, and it lets you do that without like a lot of tediousness and fuss of getting that set up ready okay um so that was a great comment um matt actually had another comment that i don't think i've ever done um so matt said something i find really helpful uh, when debugging, it's highlighting the function name in a script um, and pressing F1. So let's do that. I've never done that before. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and it brings up the documentation for that function right away. So that was a great tip instead of searching. So thank you for that. All right. Um, and let's kind of walk through this together a little bit. Um, so we got up to this point where I have triggered an error uh, with Peach, and I'm going to run the trace back. And it says uh, no trace back available, probably because my session refreshed. Uh, so let me trigger that error again and then run that trace back. All right. So now the trace back is available, and we can kind of see sequentially the steps that were executed in order to get to that location. So we're going into fruit average, then someplace we enter something called row means, and then we get that stop. Um, and what does that look like if we use the rlang options instead? So I'm gonna set our rlang options. Um, I'm going to trigger an error, and then I'm gonna run rlang last error and rlang last trace. And here we just get a little bit more of that context again. Uh, that there was this function in our global environment called fruit average. And then within that function in our global environment, it executed this base function called row means. And row means is like where that thing happened. But we still don't quite know why, but we know that's where. All right. Um, and now let's trigger the interactive debugger. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over to our source me and we're going to put our browser statement in here. Now you can choose where you put that browser statement. So you might have put your browser statement on the first line, um, but you can actually put it in different places. So maybe I want to open up my environment here, my interactive debugger. 
And that'll go ahead and execute those two lines of code above it for you. Because, you know, like I know that I don't probably have an error um, in those two lines of code, code, like the two line, the error was triggered when I got to row means. So um, I can put it in a different place if I wanted to, uh, just to demonstrate. So I'm going to restart R and I'm going to source the script. And now I am going to trigger that interactive debugger. And so now when I've done it this way, um, I already have very like some values in my global environment. Some code has executed. I can type list uh, ls.stir to see everything in there and the structure of it. Um, so we have calls, which is an integer value of three. We have dot, which is a data frame. Uh, we have our mini dot, which looks like it is a vector of three values. And we have the pattern that we are looking for, which is peach. And now uh, one clue that we have is when I click in to go to next, um, first of all, I say that we're about to execute this message line. I'm going to click in so that that message line actually executes. One thing that's a little weird here is like it says found blank fruits. Um, so that might be a clue here. Um, why doesn't it know how many columns Minida has? Like if we execute this in the environment, that's kind of a clue. In call of Minida is null. And why is that? Does anyone know if you want to pop in the chat? Yeah, so thank you, Vanessa. Minida is a vector, so it doesn't actually have columns in it. So that's one clue. It's like expecting a certain data, a certain object type that it doesn't have. So, um, and then when we go to execute our row means, um, one thing that we didn't really talk about, but that we can do, I'll, I can do it two ways. I'll do in so that when we execute row means, it's like, okay, this is where the error is triggered. Um, at row means, but we have found a little bit more of that context about um, uh, why it was triggered. Like, like we were expecting probably some sort of data frame or matrix, and we only had a vector instead. Um, if we trigger this again, trigger the interactive debugger to open again, um, I'll highlight another feature that you can use that I want you to explore in exercise two a little bit more. Um, so I'm going to hit in for next, in for next. Now there's another function you can use here, not just keep going next, try S for step into. So S, when I step into this, it's not just gonna say, oh, row means has an error. It's actually gonna let you get into row means. Ah, we don't own row means, row means is not ours. Um, it is a base R function, but now all of a sudden we are into the body of row means and we can do the same thing that we were doing before where we can type in, um, that looks a little weird, but in, I don't think the highlighting is correct here, um, but it says it's approximate because the source is not available. So that is a little bit confusing, um, but we did kind of execute lines three and four. Um, now we're kind of uh, around lines five and six where it's checking these conditions, like do I have something that has columns and rows? Um, and then when we, uh, hit and now this is where we can see um, we have failed that condition that we uh, do not have any columns and it doesn't have the correct dimensions um, in order to execute the row means function. So that is kind of the context. If I click in again, I think it'll uh, trigger the error message and um, get us out of the debugger. So that is the context of why everything is happening. Um, another thing, you know, that might be helpful is not just to trigger the debugger on um, an error, but trigger it when things are working well. So like Barry will work, but I can still treat, trigger the debugger and bear um, on, on Barry. And you can see here that mini dot, um, instead of being that vector, uh, is now the um, a data frame. So it's got that dimensionality that we are expecting in order to take row means. So we've kind of come to the conclusion that the problem really is right here. It's an in that construction of 
mini dot. Um, when we take mini dot and we subset it on the columns that we want, um, when there are two columns, so we can do like dot kind of comma one to two. Uh, when you retrieve two columns uh, using this bracket notation, uh, you will return a data frame. However, when we retrieve one column from this behavior, we retrieve, uh, return a vector. Um, so that is the source of the error, and we need to figure out how to correct that in order to proceed with the function. I'm going to pause here for questions. And I don't know if Matt is going to be able to focus for the rest unless I tell him the solution now. <laughs> so if you want, I can go ahead and just close the solution. All right, let's do that so we're not uh, distracted and we're ready to learn um, uh, more debugging techniques. Uh, if we go over to, I'm still in my browser, I'm gonna exit out. I am going to go over to my files over here, uh, get back up one level, and here's the super secret fixed fruit average. So if you want to take a look at it right now, um, what we can do is add this option here when we do the subsetting of drop equals false. And like I wouldn't have known uh, where to find that either. It's hard to uh, know that one off the top of my head, but it's just a little option you can use. I think this also illustrates like a common um, feature that you see uh, sometimes when working with base R functions that um, the output types aren't always consistent. Is there a way to run browse simultaneously so that you can compare the output of a working and not working input? Mm. No, uh, so the browse, uh, the interactive debugger is going to be run on a single function call. Um, but I mean, I guess to that point, we could have done something different. So if we are triggering our, our browser um, where things actually work, right? So. Uh, we have many dot here. We know things are working well. And it was just kind of like what I was doing earlier. Um, we have our, our regular mini dot for Barry. But what if I want to do mini dot for um, Peach, right? So I can just kind of set up like whatever I want to do in here. Like calls Peach is uh, G rep uh, Peach. Um, and now I know what calls peach is. It's that third column, right? Um, and now I can say mini dot peach is going to be uh, dot, and then that's going to be whoops, uh, calls peach instead. And so now I can compare mini dot and mini dot peach. And kind of kind of play with it in your con uh, in your in your interactive debugger so you can see that visually. So I hope that helps, Brian. All right, so I'm going to stop it now. And I know everyone has been sitting at their computer for an hour and 15 minutes. So I think this would be a very good time to take a stretch break. Um, so I am going to set a timer for five minutes, go on mute, get up, walk around, do what you need to do, and we'll be back in five minutes.
All right, I hope everyone had a good stretch break and we will resume. So what we've already started with, uh, by using the traceback and the browser, um, and we've seen kind of how the browser kind of implements steps that helps us facilitate steps that we were already taking before. But what might be like a drawback of using the browser statement here? I don't know if anyone has any clue of what I'm talking about, but curious to see if you have any ideas. Yeah, Priyanka, you're gonna forget to remove it, right? Like you have literally changed the body of your function. And this happened to me last night when I was reviewing the content for the workshop and I wasn't getting expected behavior. And it was because like, I was like going crazy. I was like, why isn't this working? Why is the debugger keep opening when I don't want it to? And it was because I forgot and left my browser statement in there. So yeah, that is definitely a drawback to using the browser statement. But of course, it's got these wonderful advantages that you can put it anywhere you want. Um, and then it opens up that awesome interactive debugger. So. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and delete it now before I forget and save the source me script, but we'll be moving on to exercise two in a little bit. All right. So you've kind of started with these basic tools you can use to debug your own code. And I want to show you a little bit more specific tools still for debugging your own code, um, but how you can leverage our studio for that. And so there's this thing called editor breakpoints. An editor breakpoint is this little red circle that you see over there uh, next to the numbers in your script. And it's the exact same thing as entering or submitting that browser statement, but you don't have to change your code. Um, and I think, I don't think there's, um, you know, a strong preference, like one way or another, like think like informal polls will say like 50% use the browser statement and 50% use the editor breakpoint. So it's just like whatever you like to do. And I'll demonstrate this in a minute. Um, and so to set and reset an editor breakpoint, you're just gonna click to the left of the line number in the source file um, or press shift F9 with your cursor on the line. And to activate, once you have this editor breakpoint, you do need to like source in that function, or if you're typing out a command to do it, you wanna um, type out the command debug source rather than the source command. So let's go over here and demonstrate this editor breakpoint. I'm gonna get out of these scripts and kind of start with a fresh session, restart R. Notice everything deletes from my environment. When I do that, I'm gonna open up my functions. Uh, my functions still have my browser statement in it, so I'm gonna remove that. <coughs> and I'm gonna set my editor breakpoint. And all I have to do um, is to click to the left of the line. Now it gives me this helpful note that the breakpoint will be activated when this file is sourced. So right now it's an open circle. It is not a closed circle. So I do need to take this action to source the file. Notice that when I source the file, it does execute the command debug source that I um, mentioned in the slides. Um, what you see over here in your environment is we see our functions, but kind of mirroring what we know that this function f has a red circle beside it, which means we have uh, submitted, it's got that editor breakpoint on it. And now we can go about debugging just like we would. So again, I will trigger uh, the interactive debugger. Um, just anytime I submit or call the function, it doesn't have to be for an error. So G of one doesn't result in an error, but it will open up the interactive debugger just like you already saw. So it's your choice if you want to use the browser statement or that and um, or that red circle. It'll do the same thing. And just like the browser statement can be inserted anywhere, that red circle can be in a, inserted anywhere in your script as well. 
another thing that we didn't really talk about before, um, we talked about like the keyboard commands, like N, S, capital Q, to work through the interactive debugger. There are equivalents here in RStudio. So we have N is the equivalent of next. S is the equivalent of this icon, which is step into. Uh, we have another icon, execute the remainder of the current function, uh, continue until the next breakpoint is encountered, or stop. So if you don't want to use the N and the S, you can use um, these icons here to kind of navigate the interactive debugger. So again, I'll trigger it again, um, and we can just play around with whatever happens here. Um, and then you can use the stop button instead of the Q. All right, so that's our debugging console. And then there's actually settings in your RStudio IDE for actions to automatically invoke on an error. So I'm going to go back over to the uh, RStudio cloud. Uh, you can see these here under, I'm going to actually remove my editor breakpoint, um, clear this out. So now um, there is no editor breakpoint. Um, if I call uh, G of A, I'm going to result in an error, but not open my browser anymore. But there are things you can do to set up automatic, automatic options um, when you do see an error. So if we go over to the debug menu in your uh, RStudio console, and then you go down to on error, so right now, all of you probably have the same option selected that I do, where on error says message only. And that's exactly what you're seeing right now in the console. When there's an error, we see the message that um, the error results in. We can change this to error inspector. So when we change this, mm, hold on one second, there's some like nuances here. I'm gonna give you a different, function set up. Okay, I'm going to copy and paste this. I'm going to give you a little bit of a new setup over here. So let's uh, delete, comment this out. All right. Um, okay, I'm going to restart R. Okay, and I'm going to source these functions. So we have two functions now that are a little bit different than the functions that we were working with before. Um, so where we're using string split, um, but we're kind of doing the same thing where we're just kind of setting up some dummy functions for demonstration. And um, so what string split is gonna do is it's gonna take this character string and split them. Um, and so you can see here, uh, it separated A comma B into the values A and B. But what happens when you put in a factor, actually, let me go back and set my sessions to message only first so you can see what it looks like for message only. So debug says on error and then it says message only. So if I put a factor in instead of a character string, now uh, string split is resulting in an error. It says we, you didn't give me a character. I don't know how to handle a factor. Please don't do that. Um, so that's the message that we receive. But we could also um, tell it instead of just a message, we want to see the error inspector. So I'm going to trigger that um, again. So when everything works fine, it's not going to change the behavior of your RDE. But when we trigger it with an error, now we get something, some slightly different behavior in our IDE. So you're going to see this window pop up that says show traceback. Um, and then it's going to show you what that base R traceback looks like. And then you also have this option here that says rerun with debug, which is going to open up that interactive debugger for you. But it will open it up in a very specific place of where that error actually was triggered. So you get over here when you hit rerun with debug. And to me, this is like 
I don't know what to do with this, <laughs> right? It opens it up in a very specific place. And I'm not really sure how to like navigate this or understand this better. Um, but the option is there. So depending on kind of the complexity of the functions you're working with and how well you know them, um, you know, it it may or may not be as useful as like knowing where you're opening that interactive debugger. But I am in the interactive debugger now because I clicked on rerun with debug. So I'm going to click stop. The last option that we have in debug is on error and break in code. So now I'm going to break in my code. I'm going to show you what it looks like when there's no error. And when there is no error, everything happens uh, as usual. But we're remember what we're doing here with these IDE options is we are changing the on error behavior only. So when I do trigger it with an error, um, remember the option I had selected here was debug on error break in code. And now it's opening the interactive debugger. So that's what the break in code means, it means open the interactive debugger. And in this case, it's the exact same place that we saw before um, where it's kind of like right where that error happened. Now you did get a little bit of um, a glimpse of what I was about to say, like when we were playing around with our first functions, like none of these, the messaging or the error inspector didn't get triggered. And the reason why the error inspector didn't get triggered before when I was playing around with like X plus one um, is it's only invoked if the IDE detects that your code is involved. So if you feel like you're like, that's weird, I would have like expected to see my error inspector and it's not there. It's just because of this feature that it needs to detect your code. So not worth like getting into nuts and bolts details, but like like what we did first, like didn't trigger the error inspector, um, but other things did. Um, there are also other options you can change in RStudio. Um, so if you kind of want to bypass this, your code has to be involved, uh, you can go to tools, global options, and uncheck use debug error handler only when my code contains errors. Uh, so that should, in theory, kind of be able to more broadly trigger that error inspector, not just for your code. So what we have done so far is we've talked about debugging options in the RStudio IDE. So we've talked about how to set a breakpoint and how to use the error inspector or how to break in your code. So that's what we're gonna practice in our next exercise. And before I turn you loose in the next exercise, I wanna set the stage for it a little bit. So when we open up our next exercise, I'm gonna open up the solution. I'm gonna restart R, always important. Um, I'm gonna let you see what the source we looks like. <clears throat> and before, when we looked at fruit average, it was actually just kind of like one function. Now we have a series of very small mini functions um, that are composed together to retrieve the fruit average. And so what I want you to play around with this time as you're going through the debugger process um, for our studio options, I want you to play around specifically with the S the step into to get a feel for how it lets you not just execute another function, but step into that function um, to see how it works and what's inside that function as well. So I'm going to start the timer and let you have a go at this. Um, you're welcome to pose any questions in the chat.
All right, that is time. Um, can you give me like a little head nod if you feel good about moving on or a thumbs up? I think the second time goes a little bit quicker now that you've already seen the interactive debugger. Thank you. Um, so let's see here. We have the same exact thing, but with a slightly different composition. Um, I have not sourced in the script, so I will source it in. Um, and now instead of just uh, one function, we have a series of functions that are composed together to compute the fruit average. We still have our fruit data in there. Still going to work fine when we see fruit berry. We're still going to still have my, if anyone had this, you might still have your debug option set on error to break in code. So I'm going to go back to message only and not break in my code right away. Um, so that when I trigger my error, um, I'm going to see my message only. I can do my trace back to see the location of my error, which looks like slightly different uh, than what it did before. <clears throat> um, probably like maybe one more step. I can't remember. Um, I'm going to set my options with Rlang and trace and see what this trace back looks like now. And you can kind of see how the nested function calls are working a little bit more. So we're going to call fruit average from our global environment. We're going to call compute average for our global environment. And then we're going to invoke row means from base R. It's kind of showing you exactly where that error occurs. And uh, now we are going to modify the source of our script. And I we're going to put a breakpoint in the fruit average function. So I'm just going to go down here. Um, looks like I already had that breakpoint set, but I'm going to look at this. Um, and let's go ahead and put the breakpoint here on Minidat. Of course, you can put it on any line in the function that you want to. Or maybe message fruit will kind of more closely mimic what we did before. Going to resource in. I don't think I need to resource it in. I think the breakpoint is already active. Um, and so now when I trigger the error, I should be entering my interactive debugger. And I have entered it in such a way that I already have a couple, I don't know if it entered exactly the place I expected it to. So I'm going to resource in the file. And now I'm going to trigger it. All right. And I'm going to just kind of see what's in my environment. Um, and I have my data frame and my mini dat, which we already know is a vector, but just pay attention that you can now like, just use that step into, because that step into is like pretty powerful. I can step into my message fruit function and, um, like execute what's happening in my message fruit function. And now that I've executed message fruit, I've stepped back out of message fruit. And now that I'm on compute average, I can step into compute average and I can see that compute average is trying to call row means and I can execute that line. Um, and I can step into row means. And now I know like, okay, the problem is here. We're checking some dimensionality condition that fails um, if we kind of walk through this. Um, you can also see what happens. Um, uh, I'm going to remove the breakpoint and restart our. I'm going to go back over here source the function and get, uh, source that script again. Um, and now on error for our IDE error inspector, let's see here, we're in debug on error. I'm at message only. So let's see what happens when we do message only. And um, we've seen that message several times already. So we know what that looks like. What does it look like when we do error inspector? Let's trigger that error now. Um, so when we do error inspector, I can show the base traceback there that we've already seen before, and I can rerun with debug. And so note where it pops out in debug. We've already seen this place because we've explored this um, function so much, but it is popping us straight into row means. 
And if you didn't know where row means was the problem, this might be like a little disorienting to just like land straight here. Um, but that's what the uh, that option is doing for you in the error inspector. So I'm going to stop and demonstrate the last one, which is on error. We're going to break into our code, which again is just going to open up that interactive debugger straight into the row means right where that error happens. I'm going to reset my debug options back to message only so I don't trip myself up later and forget those options were set. Are there any questions about these options in the IDE? There was one question in the chat about um, do breakpoints persist? So let's set a breakpoint somewhere. Um, actually, let's restart our first. Let's set our breakpoint here. Let's source the file. Our breakpoint is set. Um, and now let's see what happens when I restart R again. Not really sure because the, the file hasn't been sourced, but the breakpoint is there. So I think if I source the file, it'll be there with the breakpoint. So that, that breakpoint is there, but not mm, going to be executed until that file is sourced, yeah. And before I knew what this was, I certainly like would accidentally click and like have read breakpoints in my script and like not know what it meant. <laughs> Are there any questions before we move on? <clears throat> All right. So we've talked about debugging your code. We've talked about some using the browser. We've talked about browser statement. We talked about tracebacks. Um, and we've talked about specific tools in the RStudio IDE. But what if it's not? your code you need to debug? What if it doesn't live on your machine? What if you need to debug or get into someone else's code, like the base R row means function? Um, so there's another function we can use. Another function we can use is the debug function. And the debug function is the same as a browser statement or a breakpoint, but in the first line of the function. So like, you know how you can put that browser statement anywhere. You know you, how you can put that um, breakpoint anywhere in the body of your function to kind of have some things already executed for you. But if you just want to get into things right when your function starts, you can use debug. Now, one thing to be careful about with a debug function is it means that interactive debugger is going to be initiated every single time that function is executed until you are a member to undebug it. And now I've never personally experienced this, but depending on how your function works, people have reported that they can get trapped <laughs> in the debugger with this. Um, so let's go ahead and, and demonstrate what this might look like. Um, so here I have some functions. I'm going to source them in. I'm going to say debug the function G. So now I have set G to debug. And when I call G, this is not even triggering an error. Remember this one worked. <clears throat> I have uh, opened up um, my interactive debugger. And I'm like, okay, no, I don't want to be in here. I'm going to stop it. And now I go to execute G again, and it opens up my interactive debugger again. Um, and so it, it persists. The option is going to persist until you remember to undebug G. So now I'm undebugging G, and now I can execute my function as normal. So it is an option that will persist for you. 
Um, if that is a little annoying um, or you don't want to get trapped or anything like that, you can also use debug once, which is what I use more frequently. So debug once is executing one time only, and it's only going to execute when that function is called for the first time. <clears throat> so if I go over here and I say debug once, my function G, and I want to get into G and see what's happening. Now I've gotten into G, but I like want to get out of my debugger. And now I want to execute G. Like I'm not going back into the debugger over and over again. I don't have to remember to undebug it. It's just a one single time, like browser statement, a single time breakpoint or whatever. But it's still opening that interactive debugger for you. And then the other thing, like, let's take it back to like the section that we're in, right? We're in, we're in debugging other people's code. So debug, you just saw it, it, debug, debug once it worked on my code. But imagine that if you want to get into someone else's function where the function is something that lives in a CRAN package or lives in GitHub, you can't physically go in there and amend that function with a browser statement. And you can't physically go in there and like set a breakpoint on that script, right? So when you can't actually do that in the body of the function, you can use these debug and debug once options for other people's code as well as your own code. Here's another, there's a, a variety of options you can set in your global uh, workspace for uh, errors and warnings and different things like that. Um, we've already talked about using options equals error, error equals our link and trace for a richer trace back on error. There's another option you can use called error equals recover and just kind of remember we're talking about digging into other people's code and, and this is going to help for your code or for other people's code. And it's got a little cowboy hat on it because it just lets you hop into places and break in. Um, and so what it's going to do for you is it's going to display an interactive prompt with frames and allow you to select where you enter the debugger. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, execute something like this. So I'm going to grab options error equals recover. And that um, maybe it goes without quotes. Yep. Okay. Um, so now I'm setting options for error to be recovered. I'm going to execute G of A. There's no error here, so I shouldn't see anything different happen. Like my function is just going to execute whatever. Um, but remember, we're going to trigger an error when we submit a factor to this function instead of a character string. So now this is going to trigger an error, and now we should see different behavior when that error is triggered. Um, so when that error is triggered, it's saying, hmm, all right, well, there's different places we can get into your function now. Uh, so do you want to explore your function in frame one for G of the factor? or in frame two, where we call f of x, or do you want to explore it in frame three, where we go into string split? And so you can kind of select where you want to play around. So I'm going to play around in, um, in option one, frame one. I'm going to see what's in there. And I'm like, oh, OK, so I see a factor. I've got a level. Yeah, I'm not really sure what's happening there. Um, uh, I'm going to click next. So oh, OK, well, that function was pretty short. I'm out of that. Now I can choose a different frame to go into. Um, maybe I'm going to go into f of x. OK, so this is going to call string split. Um, I'm not really sure what I'm doing here, so I'm going to click next. Oh, it's going to give me my frame selection again. All right, so let's go into what's happening in frame three, where we're calling string split. And this is kind of where we're seeing uh, what we already saw earlier. So it allows you to select, kind of interactively select where you're entering um, that function which might be nice if it's someone else's function and you can't control where you put that browser statement or where you put that breakpoint. Mm 
let's take a seven minute break before we talk about Trace. Um, give yourselves a little bit of a stretch and then uh, we will be together for the remainder last hour of the workshop. Um, Want to make sure this one's like a little bit trickier. So take a break. I'm going to reset this for uh, seven minutes and start it. And I will see you all in a little bit.
Right, so for those of you in the UK, I know it's a little bit later on a Friday. I just want to say thank you for hanging in there, and I hope this is worth it for you all. Uh, we're coming back to uh, debugging their code. So what are things I can use to break into other people's code that I don't own that don't live locally for me? And another function that we uh, can have at our disposal is the trace function. So the trace function has an argument for what? And you supply a function. It has an argument for tracer, like how you want to do the tracing, and you can supply the browser statement. And so when you supply the browser statement to a function, uh, to the tracer argument, it's like inserting browser into the first line of the function. So trace of a function with a browser statement is the exact same equivalent to debug of the function. That went the wrong way, okay. <clears throat> um, but like what we were saying before with debug and debug once, it only opens up that browser into the first line of your function. It's like putting it in the first line. You can also use trace if you if you really want to jump in to a specific location in the function and the code is not yours. That's kind of where trace really shines because you can tell trace where to insert that browser statement for functions that are not yours, code that is not yours. So you can specify the at equals argument to insert the browser at the second step of the function. And um, like debug, it's going to stay on until you turn it off. So untrace of that function is going to cancel the tracing. Uh, so let's grab an example over here. I'm going to copy this and move it over to our, our studio. I'm going to kind of comment out these work on a different example up here. I'm gonna restart R. So we do have a function, use this handy trick I just learned called column sums, um, pull up the documentation for it. It's a base function and it forms row and column sums and means uh, for row means and column means and all that. And so I wanna trace it. And the way I wanna trace it is using the browser statement. And so what it's going to do is it's going to open up that interactive debugger in the very first line of the function. Uh, so I am going to submit this and it tells, we have a note printed to us that we are tracing the column sums function in the base package or in, in base. I'm gonna execute it. And when I execute it, it's going to open up the source code for column sums. Um, it's pretty similar to some of the source code we saw earlier for row means, right? Um, we're working kind of in the same family here. And then we can go through the interactive debugger as we did before, um, where we can say, okay, well, what objects do I have in my requirement? ls.stir, and are they like meeting the re uh, uh, requirements of this function? And here we can see we submitted a vector to column means where it's expecting, expecting something of two dimensions, not one dimension. Um, I can get out of this, but of course, when I execute column sums again, I'm going to trigger it over and over and over again until I remember to untrace it. So I'm gonna untrace it. Um, and now when I execute it, I should just see the message um, that I'm, I need something of two dimensions. Uh, instead of entering the debugger. So that put that browser statement on the first line, but what if you kind of like want to figure out actually where you want to put that browser statement in? And so what we're going to do, <laughs> some stuff like we're going to convert the body of the function the list and we're going to investigate it. It's a little weird. Um, so let's 
th this is the picture side by side of what you see. I'm going to uh, take this over to our studio cloud and, and show this to you. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to create an object called X, which is the body of the function. I'm also going to pull up the function call sums so you can see it. So here is the call sums function, um, kind of like you already saw the inside of it when we were in the interactive debugger. Uh, and we have created this body, this object called X, uh, which actually represents, if I go to view X, represents the different steps in the function stored as a list if that makes any sense at all. So I'm going to pull this function up side by side. I'm going to find that window that I just popped out. So here we have our X object, which is a list. And each little step in that function is like a list with a sub list. And you can kind of keep drilling down into this to figure out exactly where you want that, a place to insert your trace. So we know here that our function is failing on this condition that it doesn't have the right dimension. Um, and it can break down this code to like, there's an if statement, and then there's some condition on being array um, or you know the length, or there's a stop message, right? So these are the three things that are happening within this third step. So now that we have saved that object X, it, the only point here is to kind of help you identify the different steps of the function. Um, and you can kind of dig into these different steps. So let's see here. We'll go to um, x double bracket three. Is that like that full, full line uh, that we saw that corresponds to the body of the function? I'll do as that list x double bracket three. Um, it kind of breaks it down into like the three different steps there. Um, so you can kind of keep drilling down uh, to the exact place that you might um, want to step into your code. And the notation is very heavy here, um, but once you identify your spot that you want to insert your code, so perhaps I have identified this specific location uh, where I want to insert my code. I want to insert that browser statement right when we get into this if call. So like right here where I see if, the very first time I see if, that's where I want to jump into uh, the interactive debugger. Um, and just kind of some nuances and different ways you can specify that notation um, this notation underneath is the equivalent. So we are going to get the same exact thing out. It's going to call back that if statement out. Um, and now we can use that notation to specify exactly where we are going to enter our interactive debugger. So now I say, okay, I want to go in exactly at this step. Now I'm going to trigger that interactive debugger by calling the function where I know there's a problem. And now I can do my usual debugging, figure out what's in my environment. If it meets the uh, needs that I have, I can click next um, and say, okay, well, I've already made it to my stop statement. It's definitely more of an advanced debugging tool, uh, but it is there for you when you need to break into someone's code at a specific place. So for debugging their code, we've talked about debug, debug once, trace, and error equals recover. And now we are going to simulate debugging their code um, on exercise three. So I'm gonna restart R and then close out my functions, clear out everything, close out this window. I am going to open my files, find exercise three. I'm gonna open the solution for you. So I've already restarted R 
And there's a package that's already installed and loaded into your RStudio environment. And it is the WTF debug package. So the WTF debug package just does the exact same things that we already did. It's got a function in there to compute the fruit average. It comes with the fruit data set. So I can attach the package with library WTF uh, debug. I can view the fruit data. I can confirm that the fruit average works and all of that uh, for Barry. And I also should still see that error when I try to submit it on Peach. But now it's in a package and you don't have access to the source code in the package. So your objective um, for this uh, portion is to play with the debugger tools and see how they work when you don't have access to the source code. And I'm going to start the timer.
right, let's come back together now. And check out exercise three. So I'm gonna just, uh, for good measure, restart our, you see my global environment is empty. I have no functions saved locally. I'm going to attach the WTF debug package. Again, nothing still in my global environment. I don't have access to the source code at all, but there's some data in the package. So there's the fruit data, there's the fruit average function. So I can still see <clears throat> uh, the average of the berry fruits and I'm still gonna trigger that error when I run peach. Traceback is a base R function that works on code that you own and code that other people own. So I can still see the steps that led to the error with the base R traceback. And I can still see it uh, with R lang and trace as well. So I can see, um, trigger the error, and then um, look at the steps. But what's different about the steps com now compared to before was that these functions were living in our global environment. And you saw those functions prefixed by the word global. But now these functions live in the WTF debug package. So now you see them prefixed by the WTF package, WTF debug package were applicable. So it gives you that context of where those functions are. Um, because this uh, code is in ours, we can use debug once to enter the interactive debugger for fruit average. And it's gonna not only trigger the interactive debugger a single time when I execute this code. So I'm going to execute it because we don't have the source code uh, for this fruit average function, it says like debugging location is approximate, source code is not available. So you see the highlighting kind of gets a little bit different um, when you don't have a source code. But we can still hit in to go through our uh, function step by step. We can uh, do S to step into things, figure out what's happening. All right. So what are the, what do I call out uh, when I do my grep, um, execute that figure out what's in my environment. Um, and now I see, okay, well, I called out column three and I've got this data set. I know my pattern. I'm gonna execute mini dot. Um, I can step into mini dot. I can execute it. I can retrieve dot calls if I want. Uh, I know what calls is. So now like notice here that when I'm doing this, when I'm stepping into the environments, I'm still able to step into each function's unique environment so I'm not in the compute average or function or fruit average function anymore. I'm in the reduced stat function. I can go back and forth uh, between different environments and I can see what is in the environment for reduced stat. There's only two things in there. It is uh, the calls and the data frame. I can submit it to see what happens. Um, I'm going to get that vector back out. We know that's the problem. Um, and now I've exited from reduced stat and I can still get into um, message fruit, um, and I can still trigger, exit the debugger when that error is triggered. Um, and now, because I only did debug once, if I trigger the um, error again, I'm just going to get the message, not enter the interactive debugger again. I can use options error equals recover. Um, yep, that worked okay. So I put on my new line. Uh, and trigger the recover frames. And I can select which frame uh, of the execution I want to go into. Um, so maybe I want to go into the compute average frame and see what's going on there. Um, so I'm going to do ls.stir, uh, see that I have a vector and try to execute row means. Um, and results. Um, notice like when you do options error equals recover, you are only living in that frame. So it doesn't allow you to kind of go through the full execution of that function. It's only like on a frame by frame basis. So I'm gonna escape out of that and I'm going to reset the options to null. We're gonna to try to use trace. So we're gonna convert the body of the function to an object to X and take a look at that. And we can see the different steps of the function that you are already very familiar with. 
we can identify a step that we want to enter. So we want to enter at the compute average spot um, and convert that uh, notation to something that we can put in in the at argument for the trace. So we're going to go into step five one uh, when we trace or to insert our browser in that specific location. So now we are tracing that function and we're going to put it in our browser and trigger it. Um, and now we have hopefully arrived at the place where we expect it. So um, if we are looking at our function environment for fruit average, I wanted to trigger it um, at step five where I'm just going to compute the average. So we should already see all of the previous objects created in our workspace here um, above prior to that step. All right. I'm going to untrace that. So are there any questions about this content? Debugging others' code. So like just Friday and you're fried and you're like done for the day, or is it just like, I don't even know what to ask. It's been a long week of conferencing. Understandable. All right. Well, we're gonna try to talk through just a few more helpful things. So these are our proper debugging tools. And like I said, pick your favorite, right? The primary tools that we are using are traceback to figure out where the error occurred. And we're using the interactive debugger to find the context of that. And there are several ways we can get to our traceback, right? We can use some IDE options. We can use the base R traceback function. We can use the R link and trace option um, for errors. And then there are also several ways we can enter that interactive debugger, right? We can use IDE debug options. We can use the IDE breakpoint. We can use a browser statement. We can use debug debug once. We can use tracer options, error equals recover. Like there's so many different ways you can use both of these features. So just pick your favorite. And if you kind of want to narrow it down, like what is something that's going to work on everything for both your code and their code, then that makes it a little bit simpler, right? Like Maybe you just want to stick with traceback or the rlang and trace options, or maybe you just want to stick with debug debug once because it's going to work for everything. Or maybe you really like being able to like physically set that breakpoint for your code, and that's what works for you. Or inserting the browser statement. So whatever works for you, lots of ways to achieve the same thing. Special cases. So there are special cases when we come to debugging that are worth mentioning. Debugging in our markdown or quarto or whatever it is uh, that you're using these days um, is a special case. So two key things that can help you troubleshoot um, in our markdown. One, if you're working in an R markdown chunk, you can always set the error option for that chunk to be true. So you know to like. When you're knitting something, it will exit out an error out, uh, exit out on an error. But if you don't want it to exit out on an error, but you want it to print the error message and keep knitting, you can use error equals true there. And that might kind of help you figure out what's happening. And you can set that globally instead of at the chunk level as well. And the most important tool that I use when I'm iteratively uh, troubleshooting my R markdown is I use the function knit exit. So if I don't know where things are breaking in my R markdown, put a knit, knit exit up here and things work. And then I move it down and things work. And then I move it down and things break. And now I've kind of like narrowed down where the problem is. Um, so knit exit is a great way to kind of just stop the execution of your um, R markdown rendering. Uh, so you can kind of figure out iteratively where that uh, error is. Um, there are more advanced debugging techniques for our markdown, like proper debugging, not just troubleshooting. And so for that, I'll refer you to advanced R books and the WTF book as well.
There's also debugging in piped expressions if you're a fan of the Tinyverse. Um, and when you do that, trace specs can be like really long when you're working with piped expressions. So that is a separate debugging skill as well. Uh, you might want to set an option uh, for your RCPU session when debugging for pipes. So set your errors to Arlang and trace and Arlang back trace on error to branch will simplify uh, what you see when you're debugging and piped express expressions. There's also links here for contributed answers on our studio community and a blog post, a 2019 blog post by Matt Dre about fixing leaky, fix leaky pipes in R. So far, we've only talked about what behavior you want to initiate when you encounter an error. But there's other types of messaging you can receive in R, like you can receive warnings as well. And if you want to dig deeper into those warnings, you can actually have options for those warnings, like converting them to errors to initiate debugging tools. So the default uh, option that you have in your session set right now is for warn to be equal to zero. Um, but and that means like all of your code is going to be executed. And when your code is done executing, you're going to see the printed error message for your warning. If you set warning equals one, then warnings are printed as they occur, not just like when code is finished executing. And if you set warn equals to two, it's going to upgrade your warning to an error, which means it's going to halt execution when it hits that warning. And you're going to be able to use the browser um, to uh, enter your interactive debugger. So if you want to dig deeper into warnings, these are options I would try. And of course, you can combine your different options, like warn equals two and error equals recover. Or you can restore your original settings to warn equals zero and error equals null. So those are our debugging special cases um, using different warning options um, or our laying backtrace on error. Another thing that you might get into when you're debugging is you might actually need or want maybe to read the source code. And there's different ways you can access the source code. You saw me do that earlier just by typing the function into uh, the console. Um, but there's different ways you can access the source code. So you can search all of GitHub for source code. Um, actually, the source code for all CRAN packages is saved um, on GitHub as well. So here we go, Metacran, the official read only of all CRAN packages is here. We can uh, also look at the R core source, which is also saved on GitHub. So here is the core for R. So you can really get into it. When you're looking at the help file for a package, you can always look at Google and the package name. So I'm going to look up uh, read our CRAN, look at the CRAN page for it. And I can go find the link to the source code on um, GitHub. And uh, we can also find, let's see here. We can also find the old source code as well. So if, like there have been some breaking changes, you can also download the old source code. So you can see that here, I believe, read our archive for old sources. And when you get into that source code, it's likely to be in the form of a package. And if you haven't, explored looking around a package, you're probably going to want to look for things under the R folder. That is where all functions are saved in your R packages. If you don't want to poke around GitHub, you can always use package colon colon function to see exported functions. These are functions visible to the user that you'll see in the help file. But sometimes you actually need to get into non-exported functions. And to find those, you can use the triple colon 
package triple colon function. So it's your turn to investigate a CRAN package. And I want you to use whatever technique you want to, to at a very high level. And I, at a very high level, I mean like, what is the primary function this function calls? How does read R read lines work? Doesn't everyone want to know this? I'm going to give you three minutes to poke around and see if you can find the primary function that this is based on. All right, so there are many ways you could have uh, approached finding this and figuring it out. Uh, does anyone wanna drop in the chat mm, what they found and how they found it? Or you're welcome to come off mute too. Hi, is this working? Yeah, it is. Thanks, oh, Matt. Hi. Um, so, yeah, I first had to install a uh, reader in yeah. the um, in the uh, working project. Um, oh, yes. So we went to GitHub, which is a much more sensible place to go. Uh, no. <laughs> so many ways you can do it. All right. So you installed yeah. it. Um, and then once that's done uh i loaded it uh with library radar and then typed in uh radar the two uh the two colons and then the radar fun the read lines function uh and then got rid of the yeah got rid of those and then it did that and then following that it apparently uses something in room lines so did the same thing there 
then had to use the triple colon because it was doing stuff hidden away from us. And then um, I eventually got down to a function which is got the best name for a function. Uh, it's called Vroom Vroom, <laughs> um, but it's not. It doesn't look like it's an actual like R function. It looks like it's a a DLL or a, it's it, it's like written in a different language. I think. Um, so yeah, it's the the Vroom underscore huh. is the internal function, and then. That, <laughs> There's no um, wow. yeah. And there's that vroom vroom call, which when I got to that, it said something about it, DLL files and things, which I think means it's like a, a compiled program that works all by itself without R. Yeah, okay. So you took it like five steps further than, than, <laughs> than I did. So that was amazing. And it was a great uh, example of how you can walk through it. Um, so thank you so much, Matt. So first, like, we're just looking at it in our console. And we see that uh, the primary thing that it calls is read our read lines is powered by a function in the room package. And then this room lines function actually uses a non-exported function. So if we are looking at a room, uh, do I have room? Yes, I must, right? Uh, so library of room is there. And if I try to look up room underscore, uh, room underscore is not going to be found because it's not an exported function. So it's not available to users. But if you still want to sneak in and figure out what's going on, that's when you can do the triple colon and still access the body of the function. So it was like really amazing uh, investigation. And um, there was another comment in here that they from Zoe that we went to uh, GitHub. Do you want to talk through that, or do you want me to talk through it? I don't mind talking through it. I I did actually what Matt did first of all, and I couldn't find it, but it never occurred to me to look for the package. <laughs> So I went to GitHub um, and again, I tried to search in the GitHub uh, for read underscore lines and I couldn't find it. So then I went to the R folder and thankfully it's it's a really well-made package. It had a, uh, there's um, an R script called lines.r. So I was like, oh, it might be in there. Looked in there and the first one is about read lines and I was reading through the comments on there, not the comments, the documentation saying what it was for. And then you can see the the room room is listed there. So that was yeah. what I was trying to find, which is what Matt did by installing it. So then I went back to install it, and then found it that way again. So it was just the same thing, but in two different ways. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, both are great ways you can dig into the source code. Um, I'll say for me that when I first got to read R, I also did the same thing, and I was like, okay, well, I know that our functions are saved in the R folder, so I'm going to look in the R folder. It's often convention that your script name will have the same name as your function. So you might expect to come here and see read underscore lines dot R, um, but you don't. So you had a great guess that maybe I'll check the lines dot R um, and just hope and it was there. Um, you did mention that you had trouble with the search. So if I'm in here and I look for read lines, I have options that I can search in this repository, in this organization, or all, in all of GitHub. So I'm going to search in this repository, and it's going to show me the different places that read underscore lines shows up. And it's going to show up in unit testing files and tests and test that. But then it also shows me here that it actually does show up defined in the R lines R function uh, file. Um, if you had trouble finding it and you really couldn't, you could use that search feature and then find it that way. Okay, and you found the underscore is what you did, did you in, okay. So there's different ways you can get into the source code there. So great job with that, and thank you both for, for sharing. Um, if you go to github.com slash WCH slash R dash source, uh, you can look at the source for uh, base R in main, the packages included in base R in library, 
And also you can go through the R manuals and documentation. <clears throat> um, and just to kind of see if you can, let's just work through this together because we're short on time and all of that. So let's uh, look through when was the trim WFs function added to base R and how does is dot in a work. So I'm going to kind of walk through that and get set up here. All right. So we're going to look at our source. Uh, we are in github.com slash WCH slash our source. And our objective is to figure out when the trim WS function was added to base R. So I'm going to type in trim WS and I'm going to search in this repository. And there's 25 different results um, corresponding to trim WS. Uh, so we have um, some documentation files and other types of files doesn't quite get us to what we need. But if you want to narrow down the search to your commits, we can look at the commits and we can see that it was initially committed uh, to the base R source code in 2015 on January 31st of 2015. The other part of this is like, how does is dot in a work? And I'm not like particularly well suited to explain this. Um, I don't know the base R internals very well myself. Um, but there are some investigative steps you can take if you're interested in exploring. Uh, so the first investigative step you might want to take uh, is look at is.na in your console there. You get something about a primitive. You can also uh, come back over here uh, to GitHub. And then go back to where we were earlier. So we're in which are which WCH slash R dash source. I'm going to go into the source folder and I'm going to go into main. And uh, this is actually compiled from C, I believe. Anyone can correct me if I'm wrong in my interpretation. Somehow someone has to know where to search for this, or maybe we can try searching up here and is that an A, but I think this is going to give us a lot of hits here. Uh, so it's in 484 places, 47 commits. Um, but if you keep scrolling through here, you might actually land upon the, the file that I was going to direct you to, which is names.c. And we scroll down, we can see is.na in here. Uh, that's is.name and is.na. And um, it's telling people who know C better than I do how this function is defined. So the code is there to dig into if you want to. So I hope the three hours were useful to you all. And debugging is an exercise that can definitely be frustrating, but it's also an opportunity to learn like what's really happening in your code to get a better understanding and to make things a little bit better. Uh, so, you know, the three concepts we talked about today were basic troubleshooting steps, proper debugging tools, and how you might want to uh, read the source documentation. So I hope you all found it useful and, and thank you for joining me. Oh, Zoe, if you are off of mute, we cannot hear you. Oh, really? Oh, there you are. Yeah. Okay. My computer's playing up. I'm just going to share yeah. with everybody um, a short form for feedback. Uh, if you wouldn't mind just taking some time, because this is um, a really great workshop from my point of view, but it's always nice to get some feedback. Um, and yes, just thank you very much for the three hours. It was a full on journey through debugging. So thank you so much. Um,
and I hope the coffee lasted as well for it. So I could um, pause, I can stop recording.